Hello, and welcome to this episode of Lift Every Voice. Lift Every Voice is a program of the Louisville Branch NAACP in which we seek to keep our community informed of the issues and matters that are of importance at, in terms of the advancement of our community, whether that is in education, whether it's in politics, voting rights, or whatever. We are out there on a daily basis fighting on behalf of you. The, the NAACP is a civil rights organization and has been battling for civil rights for 113 years. And, it, and even after 113 years, there remain issues that we must continue to fight and fight for all the time. One of the most important areas in which we are fighting is the, in the area of education. Education and to, has been the bedrock of a lot of the work that the NAACP has done over the years. The NAACP was there in 1954 in the Brown versus Board of Education case. The NAACP was there in the, in the early 1970s when Jefferson County desegregated its public schools in the community. So the NAACP is very much interested in doing that. Even today, we're still on the battlefield trying to make certain that each and every kid in this community gets a full and complete education, and we will continue to fight for that. Education is on the front burner again in this community, and today we have the, the distinct pleasure of having with us a distinguished educator who knows the workings of Jefferson County Public Schools in and out, who has served in leadership roles and positions, and continues to this day to fight for equal and equitable education for all kids and particularly for black kids. I'd like to welcome Ms. Faye Owens. Faye, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Faye, to give some context to all the things that I've said in our discussion, let's talk about you and your experience in JCPS. When did you come to Louisville? When did you get involved? And, and the positions that you have. We know that when you retired from JCPS, you were an elementary school principal. So tell us about Faye Owens and what she has done over the years. Well, I moved to Louisville in 1965 and uh, my degree was in accounting and I couldn't get a job in accounting. I like people, I love kids. So I thought, well, maybe I should get an education. So I applied at U of L and started working on my provisional uh, teaching certificate. So uh, in 1965, I started teaching at Parkland Elementary in the second grade. And from the second grade, I taught third grade. That was the Louisville Public School. And when we merged, I was um, from the elementary, wait, let me go back. From the elementary school, then I got into federal programs. And the first pre federal program I was in was that of being a reading specialist. And when I became a reading specialist, I went to middle school, Old Manly. And from Old Manly, I went to No Mill. In fact, uh, people in my generation who was at No Mill, we built No Mill <laughs> School. And I thought I was gonna retire as a reading specialist. During that time at, when I was a reading specialist, we merged with Jefferson County Public Schools. And uh, from there, Jefferson County needed more black administrators and I was fortunate enough to be placed as an instructional coordinator at a middle school in Carithers Middle School. Way out in the East End, I never heard of it. I had AAA to direct me how to get there. But from there, I went, uh, from there I went to a staff development and um, instructional development at all, the old Hikes Annex. I go way back. Okay. And you might not you know, have some know of these places I have never heard of. Well, Hikes Annex was a place where all of the employees went for professional development. I was a professional development specialist. So like what Gaines is today. Right, yeah. that was the beginning of it. Okay. And from there, I uh, went to, well, what happened was they had a change in superintendents. And if you didn't have so many hours of administrators, you got cut. Mm -hmm. So I was one of the ones that got cut. I went back in the classroom and then from there, I moved on up to another instructional coordinator. And then I was a coordinator of optional programs at Central Office. And that was the beginning of optional programs and magnets. 
they didn't call them magnets, they were just optional programs. Traditional schools, male high school, and youth performing uh, school. From there, I um, became a principal. And principal at Mill Creek Elementary School, which I dearly love, even after retirement, is still a part of my heart. Uh, when I was at Mill Creek, we did a, I did a lot of things to improve my PTA. Um, I did the Macarena on the, on the roof uh, because we wanted to increase our PTA. When I first got there, we didn't have, the PTA wasn't that big. So I did these things to um, get members for our PTA and it worked out. From there, I stayed at Mill Creek for 15 years. I was with Jefferson County Public Schools for 33.5 because I took off to have a baby. Okay. And I retired in 1999. And I went back for maybe a year at, uh, as a K-TIP teacher. Okay. And tell, us, tell us about what K-TIP is because I think a lot of folks have heard it but don't really understand what it is. Well, I went to Atkinson because they had so many new teachers, so my job was to work with the new teachers to help them uh, with uh, discipline, uh, curriculum, uh, just the whole bit, just there to help them. So you were sharing, sharing the experience that you had built up and learned over the years in terms of help bringing them along as new teachers. Right. Uh, and it was enjoyable, but uh, in the meantime, I got an opportunity to work with the Lincoln Foundation. And that's another one of my heart, heart uh, experiences that I dearly love, working with the Whitney Young Scholars. When I went there in, 20, in 2000, uh, I was director of the Whitney Young Scholars Program. And that's another story. Uh, from there, I was I got promoted to be director of the educational program, all of the educational programs. And there were many. Um, if you're familiar with it, the Whitney Young Scholars Program, then there was, um, gosh, I can't even remember all of them. There was Summer Institute, sure. Parental Institute, and the kids had to go to, to classes on Saturdays, right, first and third right. Saturdays. And what I liked about it was that it gave these kids an opportunity and chance to go when they became in the ninth grade, ninth, 10th, 11th grade, to go off to college, mm -hmm. colleges for two weeks. And it, it was just a marvelous experience. I loved it. And I stayed there for 20 years. So with all of that added up, if my calculation is right, you spent more than 50 years in the educational arena directly involved in some aspect, aspect or phase of education. Correct. Okay. Well, and that, and that is the reason that you're here today is that we want to want to talk about about that. Yeah, uh, you know, student assignment is is a plan that's out there, but more importantly than student assignment, you also put the put together or help start a group of the coalition of black principals and administrators. Tell us about that group. Well, that group when we when I started, we did not have a name. What happened was in the Courier Journal in March. Uh, 3rd, 2020, there was an article, and it was a report of the audit committee. And the audit committee is a state audit that audits schools regarding their scores. Right, performance. And in the paper, it stated there were eight black principals, and it stated that they were unfit to lead to lead their school and that they were not even able to be trained. When I read that, I was livid. It took me about two days and I thought, we got to do something. So what I did, I called uh, the principals, the retired principals of the schools that was listed and asked them, how do you feel about this? And we were all up in arms and said, we got to do something about it. So the first thing we did we wrote a letter to Dr. We wrote a letter and met with Dr. Polio, expressing our dis, disbelief that 
those kinds of labels would be put on principals. That, and they were not new principals, they, had, they were experienced principals. And we just thought that was degrading. And uh, he agreed with us that it was. And then we met with the uh, State Department, uh, the Commissioner of, the, of, of Education, and wrote letters and met with them. And we just told them that that, that was just dis disrespectful. And they, wait, they assured us that the next time they will not use labels. Now, since then, there has not been any audit because of the pandemic. pandemic right. But that's how we started. We did not have a name. We were just black principal, retired principals and administrators. And for me, that was all we were going to do. However, new things came up. After that, uh, after the state audit, the next thing was the critical race theory. <laughs> Those hot topics came up. And of course, we were in disbelief, disapproved of it. So we started writing letters again and meeting with people all over the, all over, uh, the educational uh, arena. We, um, we met with, uh, we wrote another letter. We, this time we wrote it to the editor of the Courier Journal and the title was, Let Teachers Teach. Teach. And in that we would, our main focus was that history has to be taught the way it happened. And um, that was a big thing. Uh, we were very proud of our letter and <laughs> we were in the paper and they took our pictures and that was the beginning. And then we started writing letters to not only Dr. Polio, but the Board of Education, uh, his cabinet. And during some of the one meeting of the Board of Education, they called us the Coalition of Black Retired Principals and Administrators. So that stuck. And that's what we're called today. But I might say that we're not really a radical group. We are a group of principals who really, our focus is on the achievement of all students, but especially black students, because our kids score the lowest and we want to make sure that they get a proper and good education. So we, you know, from there, the student assignment plan came up. Now. When we say the student, that's the beginning, the first student assignment plan that was released. I understand that they're working on another one. Supposedly working on another one. Right. That they have not shared with the community yet. Well, that has been our focus since, yeah. what, the 20s, right. 20 months. We've been working with that, I'll say, for 20 months. And we started writing letters all over again saying, how we oppose what was presented at that time. And um, that's how we got involved with the NAACP. We thought that, okay, we were just a little group of retired principals and administrators whose passion is the achievement of all students, especially black. And, and the, the, the beauty of all of this, uh, Faye, is is, is that group has gotten together and, it, and the group speaks from a, a base of experience. So tell me, uh, did, I don't know, we did some calculation in terms of the, the individual who were involved with, with you in terms of retired principals and administrators. And I think we came up with the conclusion there were over 300 years of experience among you. That's true. And some, uh, some of the principals, once they retired, they went back. That, those were just the years of principalship, right. but then they went back and did some other work for the district. And most of it was uh, trying to help principals mm -hmm. become better, or right. uh, either just to get them involved with the principalship. So what, you know, so the, what that means is, and I think our audience really needs to, to, to know that when this group does a critique or states a position or writes a letter, 
It is from a base of experience of knowing what has gone on in school, in, in not just a school, but several schools in terms of the system itself. Right, because you know, every school's different. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look back during the time that we were principals, there was a percentage of how many blacks and white students you could have at a school. And sometimes it was difficult to get the white kids into the West End schools because for some reason, uh, well, they didn't want to come. Okay, so let's, let's talk about, you know, you, you all have written a letter to talk about recommendations as it relates to the, to the new, to the proposed student assignment plan when it comes. And your first recommendation that you wrote says that the plan should include all students in K-12 regular and magnet school. Now, the, the, the uh, plan that we saw now, what, 20 months ago, two years ago, was a plan for middle and, and high schools, but not elementary school. Your group's position is it should include all those students. So talk about that. Right. Uh, we feel that elementary is where the student starts mm -hmm. and it's where those clusters start. And the clusters need to be redone because now uh, uh, the middle, the elementary schools in the West End are mostly black right. and are mostly high poverty areas. And we feel that if they're going to write a plan, it should include all students, all schools, and especially magnet schools. Because uh, the magnet schools are another way of, quote, according to Faye, um, segregating. Yeah. Because it's hard for black kids to get in those schools. And once they're in there, uh, they exit those kids based upon their grades, if they're not on grade level or if their behavior or whatever. And I understand that going forward, that they will not be able to exit magnet schools, but. Well, at least that's a proposed recommendation. We, we heard the rhetoric, but we haven't seen it incorporated into a plan yet. Well, you know, when we talked with Dr. Polio and with some of the board members, they talk about what they agree with us but we haven't seen anything written. And that's where we're concerned. We want to see it written. Now, one of the other things that we, we've, we've, we've said, heard, at least that have been discussed, is in talking about the plan, uh, that there are some who say that the student assignment plan shouldn't address or have a component around academic achievement. Tell me what your reaction to somebody who has the gall or the nature to say that. Academic achievement should be the focus of anything that any school system should have. Not just JCPS, but every school. Why write a new plan if it's not to improve the education and the achievement of our students? It doesn't make sense. It makes you think that they just, well, the way we feel, according to what we've heard, mm -hmm. and that was the first beginning of the student assignment plan. I understand they're making changes. But from what we heard, it's just resegregating the school system. It's keeping the black kids in the West End. Now, there's, and, and I don't want to hop on this, but that dual reside is not clear, and I don't think parents will understand it. Because from what we understand, dual reside means that if you do not want your child to go to the school, quote, closest to your home, quote, neighborhood school, then you can, um, there's that dual reside that will allow your child to go to the assigned school, which to me is the same as what's already been. You already go to an assigned school. school. Right. So, with the dual reside, if you don't want to go, I'll say, I don't know what they're going to do with the elementary because we haven't heard about that. But for middle schools, the, they talked about middle schools in the West End would be Shawnee. And why Shawnee can't hold all of the middle schools because Shawnee will be middle and high school. The middle schools that are already in the East End, in the West End and downtown are magnets. And to get in the magnet school, you have to apply and it's difficult for 
kids of color to get in. So I, I just can't imagine why you would, why would you write a plan if achievement is not the goal? Well, we, well I think we may find out, but you know, you, the, the other thing is, is the, the dual resides program has been coined as a choice plan, a choice meaning that students would have a choice, a choice between a high school and a, and, and a middle school in West Louisville. And, and in terms of a high school and a middle school, there are schools not, schools do not have the capacity to in fact take all of the students who live, African-American students, the students who live in West Louisville, to be able to do that. So it's sort of a false promise of choice that's not there. And from, the student assignment plan that was revealed, there was no talk of transportation. How are those kids gonna get to those away schools, so to speak? I don't know, it's not clear. And that's one thing that parents need to really look at. If they do not want their child to go to their neighborhood school, they need to find out the school that they will that be assigned to the away school, uh, what kind of scores do they have? And especially for black kids, what's the percentage of, of um, suspension? I mean, what programs do they have? What programs do they have after school? How would the kids get back home from the after school programs if they have them? Uh, and in this new plan, I would hope that they will have some kind of after-school tutoring mm -hmm. to bring our kids up to par because uh, the NTI was a good idea. It was the best that they could do, but a lot of kids fell back because of that. All right. You know, as part of the, the presentation that was done on the, the draft plan or, or the, I guess the draft PowerPoints that were put out, uh, they talked about, you know, the renovation to Shawnee, and Shawnee is now, a, a, in terms of, of, a, of a campus, finally in, at the state building-wise where it should have been 25 years ago as opposed to got elected. They talk about building a, a new middle school. All those things sound great, but as you well know, buildings may look nice, but the question is what takes place inside those buildings? And so among your, recommend, your recommend, group's recommendation has been class size reduction. So talk to us about things like that that parents ought to be looking at or asking as they look at whether or not these, these, this choice plan really satisfies what their kids need. Well, we feel that the board should consider making classes smaller. And we talked to Dr. Polio about having smaller classes. And his response was, if you make smaller classes, the schools are not big enough for that. And we said there are other strategies that you can use to make classes smaller. For instance, this is a great time right now for them, and since they have money, right. they could train paraprofessionals to work with teachers. Um, when I was a principal, every, every class had a paraprofessional, but then there was Title I money and it was reading. And reading is an area where our kids fall down on. And if they would now hire paraprofessionals and train them, starting next year, whenever this new plan starts, they can make classes smaller. Uh, we think that an elementary kid, elementary K through one, each teacher should have an instructional assistant. And you cannot put two teachers together, but because teacher shortage, and that's what we get. Where are you gonna get the teachers? Well, there are plenty of people who are not teachers who have been to uh, college and have so many college hours, and they can train them to be instructional assistants, which would help a lot. So as, as we move forward, uh, Faye, the, uh, the coalition of, of black retired principals and administrators have joined with the NAACP to try to keep our community, help to keep the community informed. And one of the things that, they, that they're going to be doing is a series of what we call white papers on subject matters and that are, so you can talk to us a little generally about uh, uh, white papers. Okay, uh, we just started with the white papers 
And the first one was just a general introduction of what the white papers would have. And it included some non-negotiables. And uh, I can't, let me find them. I can't tell you all of them by memory. But the non-negotiables, the first one was that it must be written. Right, it's a detailed written plan. It must be written and uh, it involved resources. Yeah. Uh, give me a moment. Okay, we're getting close to the end of our time. Oh. Uh, Here, there they are. Oh. At the bottom. Uh, they must, the plan must address academics. We talked about right. that. Uh, it must be reviewed annually, and there must be some accountability. Um, so a, as we wrap and, up... Is, and what, hiring of more uh, black administrators, administrators right. and teachers. Right. So as we wrap up here, what, what words would you like to leave with the community and particularly to parents as it relates to um, student assignment and, and, what they, and what should be looking for? Number one, the biggest thing is achievement, accountability, equity, justice, and resources. What we're concerned is that if there are, and it seems like it's going to happen, there are going to be schools with lots of black students in the West End. We want to make sure that there are resources resources that will continue. We want sustainability, right. not just for the next three years. What happens when the money goes? We want to make sure that our kids get the resources that they need in order that they will be able to achieve. And we'd like for parents in the West End to support those neighborhood schools by joining and being active in the PTA. Okay. Well, let me thank you, Faye, for sharing with us today in regards to the program in terms of where we are. We know that the retired teachers, retired principal, black principals and administrators will be on the job doing what they need to do. And we're really thankful and appreciative that you are coordinating and moving that group ahead. So thank you for doing that. As we close this program today, I hope that everybody who's listening and watched this are well aware of the things that we've discussed today and their importance in any new student assignment plan that comes forward from JCPS. You need to be informed and you need to make informed decisions. And the way to do that is to be aware of what is going on, be aware of the white papers that the NAACP as well as the retired princi black principals and administrators will in fact make available. And when you get that information, what we do is we ask that you lift every voice in support of the things that need to be done. Because when we lift every voice, we can have a meaningful impact in the education of our children. So on behalf of the black retired principals and administrators and the NAACP, thank you for watching this program.